I just want to meet him outside the dressing room, give him one punch, that would stop him. Wonderful bitch. Would you consider you yourself a lad? Um, yes. Lad culture, by definition, is a group or pack mentality residing in activities such as sport, heavy alcohol consumption, and banter, which is often sexist, misogynistic, and homophobic. But why do I want to document this? Lad culture is everywhere and it affects everyone who isn't a straight white man and everyone who is a straight white man in a strange way. So from this we learn that lad culture has no mercy. You're either a lad or you're a victim. The sociological definition of lad culture is quite simple to grasp, but how easily can we see it in society? To find out, I interviewed seven young men to gauge their views on lad culture, their self-identification with it, and how they drew the line between male friendships and laddish ones. Would you consider yourselves popular? No. 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 Would you consider yourselves popular? Uh, uh, I'd say so. Uh, not really. Okay. So just, yeah, not really. Fair enough. How else would you describe your friends or your friendship group? Um, fun. Hilarious. Yeah. Good Beautiful. Football. Sometimes a bit annoying. They can get a little bit too physical sometimes. I'd say we're quite um, civil, quite, civil, civil. quite a civil friendship group. You know, we don't, we're not the kind of guys to muck about um, in school. Can you name any common interests in your friendship group? Video games. Yeah. Football. Football. Yeah. Can you name any common interests among your friendship group? Um, uh, football. <laughs> Bloody hey, lads. <laughs> Come pretty badly. Um, it's worth mentioning at this point that in order to interview these groups, I had to ask for consent. And a factor of that process is making them aware that I was researching lad culture. So group two often mock the stereotypes associated with lad culture. But this gives me an insight into what lad culture really is, as well as possibly associating their banterous attitude with the culture itself. Um, what, girls? <laughs> well, yeah. right. Yeah. What, um... I think, you know, you like... <laughs> Do you think your friendship group is intimidating? No, I don't think so. Um, no, I don't think so. I say we've got the social bunch. I feel like seeing um, yeah. yeah. Have you ever been involved in a violent or aggressive incident in school, outside of school, or at... Outside of school. Outside of school. I was, I was knocked oh, yeah, out. Yeah, he's knocked out by a 30-year-old man. 36-year-old man. 36 year old man. What the hell happened? He said a swear word about his child. <laughs> on the football pitch. I got knocked out. He was one of the lads. Um, uh, football? Well, like, as football a group or individually? Uh, individually as a group? Whatever one you want. Um, maybe um, a verbal scuffle in a, in a football match on Amos Henderson. Would you consider yourself lads? No, I don't think I'm one of the lads. Okay. I was say it's developed over the years, but stereotypically, it's quite, uh, I'd say, a lot of masculine traits. Masculine, oh yeah, yeah. Well done. Lads. Good answer, Carlos. Go what are your opinions on that? Mm, I reckon it should change. It can uh, be good in some scenarios, but mm. in other scenarios, no, it shouldn't. Should do you think some groups of lads are racist or homophobic? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever been outwardly racist or homophobic? No, no. Some yeah. boys put on an act in order to fit into a lad's friendship group. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think with some of the more popular friendship groups, I think some people make it on, yeah. on an act. It's clear to see from these interviews that lad culture was something that these boys could identify and separate from other masculine subcultures. They even began to mock stereotypical laddish behaviour while recalling their experiences. Jackson, a sociologist who studied lad culture in higher education, highlights the persistency of lad culture within sports teams and the immature misogynistic nature of laddish banter. The behaviour Jackson observed coincidentally closely resembled that of the individuals that I interviewed, even though they didn't explicitly identify themselves as lads. So this raises the question, what distinguishes masculine subcultures from laddish culture? My interview with a young man who self-identified as a lad may shed light on the differences. Can you name any common interests among your friendship group? Um, football. Do you think your friendship group is intimidating? Um... Possibly at times. When out in public, how do you think the public perceive you? Uh, annoying. 
Would you consider you yourself a lad? Um, yes. How would you describe the lad's culture that you're in? Oh, um... Jerry. Do you think some groups of lads, so not, not necessarily you, okay. or... Do you think some groups of lads are racist or homophobic? Uh, yes. Have you ever been outwardly racist or homophobic? Well, I have heard these comments. Do you know why they're made? Do you know why yourself or other lads make these comments? Do you, do you have any like opinion um, on that? I'm not really. I think maybe it's environmental. In my research, I noticed a significant contrast in how the two separate groups of interviewees perceive the public view of their friendship circles. The young man who identified as a lad mentioned that people would likely find his friendship group intimidating and annoying. To confirm this observation, I distributed a questionnaire to 50 randomly chosen email addresses from my year group, asking them for their perception of lads. The questionnaire was structured with five perceptions, ranging from positive attributes like being friendly, supportive and funny, to negative perceptions, which I labelled as being awful human beings. The middle options included finding them nice enough, unnoticeable or intimidating. Out of 50 responses, 44% found lads intimidating and 22 labelled them as awful human beings. 20% said that they didn't notice them, 10% found them nice enough and only 4% perceived them as friendly, supportive and funny. Francis conducted a study on lad culture among 14 to 16 year old girls and boys in a class and the girls' responses to their interview emphasised that while lads may seem confident, they often lack dedication to education and engaged in discriminative behaviour towards minorities. These experiences contribute to negative perceptions of lad culture, which was echoed by at least 66% of respondents in my questionnaire. I wanted to learn more about those on the receiving end of lads' casual discrimination, so I met up with my friend Kiara. In our interview, Kiara describes how her opinions as a female Filipino student were constantly targeted and mocked by the lads in her class. In like citizenship classes, if I'd just be trying to express my opinion or my thoughts on a subject just because I was a girl, and especially a girl that doesn't follow like the like societal like beauty standard. Mm -hmm. Um, I was immediately shut down mm -hmm. and immediately like my opinion was just taken as a joke. I then asked her to expand on discriminative experiences, especially those surrounding her ethnicity. One day me and my friend were walking home, literally we were having a really good day just minding our business and we're walking like just, just literally like five minutes away from our house and this kid like comes up to us and starts going ching chong ching chong and we were really confused because we didn't really hear him at first but we were like is he talking to us and we looked around like obviously he's talking to us there's no one else there further to this experience i asked her to describe the type of person who would usually discriminate against her like in quotation marks the popular guys mm -hmm. sporty they kind of look down on everyone typically white i will say because for the ones i've noticed the the ones who aren't white they kind of try to assimilate with these guys, mm. but I've noticed these guys will talk about them behind their back and call them like scrapes and stuff, so they don't really fit in, but they think that acting this way towards women will make them fit in. She makes an interesting observation about how ethnicity seems to play a role within these lads' friendships. My final question for her was this. Do you think those people who made fun of you would do it without the backing up of their friends? No, actually. I actually, even if they're thinking it, I don't think they'd have the balls to say it to me because usually when they make fun of me, they're with other people. Mm. So it's like a whole group of them versus me. I don't really stand a chance. Like, I could say my opinion, I don't really care, but I genuinely w won't be viewed as being able to win that argument. My interview with Kiara touched on many fascinating points, especially the final one about the lad's idea of safety in numbers. It got me thinking about why lads were more likely to act violently around their friends. This led me to the term de-individuation. De-individuation is a concept central to Zimbardo's work and it highlights how individuals in group settings may experience a loss of self-awareness and personal identity. This can make people feel less responsible for their actions and more likely to follow what the group does, even if it's something they wouldn't do when they're by themselves. De-individuation is a widely accepted theory that explains the existence of lad culture, but eager to see this theory in action, I wanted to attend an event with lad culture firsthand. So myself and four friends, all with diverse viewpoints, went to a local football match. 
Later, I interviewed them to hear about their perceptions and experiences of the lad culture there. My goal was to observe, understand and analyse its dynamics. I recorded a lot of material at the football, but I've decided against publishing most of it due to concerns outlined in my risk assessment and personal moral standards. We delve into these reasons during the post-match interview, and this explains the absence of match day footage. Do you have any preconceived notions or expectations about the behaviour of fans at the football match? If so, what were they? Um, I think they acted pretty like I expected, lots of chanting, lots of uh, swearing, uh, quite a laddie kind of feel to the thing, but nothing nothing hateful. Yeah. I expected appalling behaviour and I got appalling behaviour. I agree with Luke. I think they were a bit rowdy and also like just very shouty. Having been to a couple working matches before, it was quite tame today, <laughs> but you always expect the worst. And then actually there was police in a fight. <coughs> oh. Yeah, so we got the worst. Did the behaviour of the fans align with your expectations? And did you witness behaviours that surprised you? Please give examples. Can I elaborate on the fight? Go for it, sure. Um, well, throughout the match, there wasn't much interaction between the Bromley and Woking fans. And then coming out at the end, they got next to each other. And then they start. there was these old Woking, Bromley fans who started, like, squaring up these young... Working fans and then the police got involved. And do you think is that common for yes. that to happen? Yes. At all the shot, a brick was thrown. The so. energy was quite aggressive. Um, mm. I yeah, uh, I felt intimidated walking into that room and place. <coughs> and yeah, that's about it. It was very aggressive <clears throat> from all ages as well. Like there was a little child who was probably about seven or eight. Mm. screaming profanities at the um, goalkeeper as well their dad was stood in front of them doing exactly the same sort of stuff and encouraging mm. the behavior like he said one of the ch the child said that kid that person's got legs like jack Grealish, and the dad told him off because he likes jack Grealish. Um, mm. so it's very much encouraged by dad and monitored by dad yeah i and think dad causes most of it and so did, 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 did anyone hear mum too i did not hear mum i did she was drowned out by dad mum was, <laughs> mum was doing exactly the same yeah. sort of stuff the mm. football game definitely brings out a certain kind of thing in a lot of people i think because yeah i think there are some people who are just going to be cocky like that all the time mm. but i think being there, like I think even when people start shouting wanky, you want to join in because mm. you it's almost get it's a bit it's you know you it's, it's good to join in. For example, we even joined in in the chants and stuff, yeah. but we knew like when to like turn it off if that mm. makes sense. Like we didn't walk out and still get so like involved in it. So true. Yeah. Whereas, say you you got that group of boys who got into like the. the started squaring up people outside yeah that was a massive group of like what like 16 year old boys yeah it can't have been much older or younger than us no and like, it was literally like there was like 15 of them or something mm. and um like for them they're with their friends they're in that environment they just then don't switch it off because they're all still trying to keep this like laddie persona i on. think mm. what i found interesting was the difference particularly in like the middle-aged kind of people you there was kind of two two sides you either had um there were some some guys who were just very keen on their football not yeah. at all like kind of they didn't look I uh, you know, they, they could be like like our dads yeah sort of thing quite a you know, friendly sort of person mm, but just, then you'd have the other side where you've got these people who've probably gone away from their families mm. and then you know and they're, they're sh hurling all sorts of abuse and kind of yeah. all this stuff and it's like would you would you act like that around your family very true you i think it's a herd like thing when they all see each other doing it it's yeah, just like well definitely. it doesn't matter if i do it as well and they all <clears> kind of <throat> feed off each other did you observe any particular symbols or expressions of identity among the fans that were associated with their culture or lads culture yes, yes. louis what? even said the bromley fans are wearing a uniform they're literally because... they were all wearing the exact mm. same thing black you know, black stony jumper mm. jeans, and they're all standing in. There was like the gag, the core gaggle of people who were like <laughs> slamming against the fences yeah. and stuff. Like they, they all like came together and like basically acting the exact same, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, but on, yeah, on Woking side. Uh, but I think yeah. a lot of Woking side looked very similar. Mm. A lot of them were like middle-aged men. Bold, yeah. very Lots true. Of smoking, yeah. 
Were there any instances of aggression or confrontational behaviours among the fans? Yeah. <laughs> I would say yeah. the thing we've discussed about the little kerfuffle outside the stadium would, yeah. probably, would link to that. The mum and the the mum and the dad of the kid who was still in front of us, um, they were talking. They were saying, "But when I just want to meet him outside the dressing room, give him one punch, that would stop him." The, the very mm. eloquent man that was behind me, he was saying how he wanted to break the referee's neck. Mm. Yeah, yeah after, after he made a bad decision, he says, "I'm gonna break his neck," and that was really pleasant. To hear. <laughs> the poor goalie, it was who could like tear the goalie's self-esteem yeah. down the most. Yeah, I know. You, yeah, you rejected from him. You, you could see him yeah. trying to like shrug it off a bit. But uh, yeah, I can't help feeling mm. a little bit sorry for him because normally they blank it out. And then this, did you hear when the little like kid at the front goes? Smith, you're shit. He turns around and goes, thanks. Yeah, I saw him acknowledge it. Mm. How comfortable did you guys feel among the fans at the football match? Shout out place. Um, yeah, I didn't really feel like I fit in there. I tried to dress to fit in, but to be honest, I just don't think I have the personality or just kind of like the aggression. I think you need to make some of these like oh, insults at people. Mm. I just don't think that's my way. I think they could tell that we weren't really like, you know, the same um, because, you know, we tried to sort of blend in, you know, wear clothes that would make us blend in. But I kept getting dirty looks, like every, you know, if I turn around, like people would be looking down at me or whatever. I think you could, they could tell just by the way you present yourself and like, mm. I guess, aura, the aura that you have. They can tell that you're not really the same. Mm. Thank you completely agree um i mean like as someone who enjoys football and who enjoys watching football to even like even i stood there and i felt out of place but i feel like that a lot of that was just my gender being a girl surrounded in such a masculine like heavy environment mm. um yeah no i i agree but i think this whole thing is this whole thing which i could uh, i could be all right with for a couple hours, which is sort of the time that we were there, but mm. I probably wouldn't want to be there much longer because whilst maybe maybe not as much as so like Luke or Kirsty, but you do I still have to act in a slightly different way that I yeah. naturally would around other, my normal peers. And how come you feel like you have to act in a different way? Because I think I think you just get judged. You would get judged. Judged for being a bit more, uh, so to speak, expressive. Mm. I think um, it feels threatening as well. Like does. if you don't you act in. in a certain way, like there's going to be repercussions. And because the crowd feels so, you know, just violent, like mm. you feel like almost that if you don't act mm. that way, then it's going to turn violent. As theorised by Zimbardo, my friends who were unaware of his theory were able to recognise the concept of de-individuation during our participant observation. They also noticed how everyone in the culture seemed to adhere to a distinct uniform, aligning with Hebdige's theory of subcultures using specific styles for identification. Attending a football match exposed us to aspects of lad culture that closely intertwined with football hooliganism. However, due to my own research into football hooliganism from Owen Jones, I know the difference can be identified through class associations. Football hooliganism is labelled as working class, whereas lad culture is almost a classless ordeal. Jones criticises the labelling of working class people associated with football hooliganism and highlights its discriminatory nature. He argues that lad culture, while not entirely positive, is viewed far more leniently than the negative stereotypes attached to football hooligans. Jones further contends that working class men interested in football are often unfairly stigmatised as hooligans, even if they don't engage in violent or discriminative behaviour. He emphasises that working class men are often depicted as bullies, whereas similar behaviour from middle class men is dismissed as simply being one of the lads. To explore Jones's view on lad culture's connections to social classes, I conducted an online questionnaire with boys from my school, who I know are from lad subcultures. I asked them to rate their social class on a scale from working class to upper class, and despite the wide range provided, most respondents who also self-identified as lads placed themselves in the middle class to lower middle category. This data aligns with Jones's theory that lad culture differs from football hooliganism as it isn't tied to particular social classes, despite the majority of respondents identifying as middle class. It's important to note that my data may be influenced because I had to ask people that I knew personally 
and due to the area I go to school, it may have had an effect. But this being said, social class is merely one aspect that influences the formation of lad subcultures. Zimbardo, Francis and Jones argue that individuals join groups primarily to feel a sense of belonging. But why join a hateful one where there are many other options? These groups often target people who don't fit their mould, including other boys. When boys seek to belittle other boys or men seek to belittle other men, it's termed toxic masculinity as they employ their idea of manliness to bully others. I performed an unstructured interview on a male friendship group to understand how toxic masculinity impacts male friendships and interactions. I started by sharing a basic definition of toxic masculinity and asking them to reflect on how they've experienced it in their lives. What do you think of like, the classic ones like in TV shows and stuff? Like old TV shows. You, you just see it a lot, really. In this unstructured interview, we didn't just talk about lad culture. However, discussing how boys interact and deal with toxic masculinity can help us understand why they might be inclined to join aggressive lad cultures. On a final note, I approached the sensitive topic of toxic masculinity with care and I allowed my friends to share at their own pace without any pressure to answer. Yeah, this you ever act, I guess, like, because some people, I guess, just feel like, boys obviously, feel like they need to be more masculine and more like men to kind of fit into some places. So like friend groups to get closer to people they want to be like, I guess. Because maybe you see someone's more popular and they're like, okay, if I'm friends with him, I'll be more popular. Yeah. Then you try to make yourself seem more of like a bully, like a toxic masculinity, you know, and just, yeah. just to get closer to them. Why do you think becoming more bully-like makes them more popular? Because maybe, yeah, you just kind of more power, so you, yeah. you get more respect from other people, just based off so people getting scared really it's so is it like, a power dynamic yeah thing? it's like well, it's yes. kind of like the king of the jungle really, yeah. really? Like if, in like if everyone sees you then yeah, then there's no one yeah. above you like it's like a tyrannic yeah. like yeah. so if it works on power and hierarchy then is there a lot of fear in male friendships I think in toxic it's, friendship. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely friends, like, for example, this, I feel so comfortable in. Yeah, I good. I care about what I am, like. Yeah. But I think of more, it's weird, because, like, it's, people call them, like, the popular, like, the more popular yeah. um, groups, I guess, you can see it much more. Yeah. Interestingly, the word popular is used again to describe the nature of these lads' friendship groups, an answer that I've also found in some of my structured interviews. I then went on to ask how they counter-attack toxic masculinity, which received a slightly different response than what I expected. Having a strong friendship group and having a place where we can talk to each other. Yeah, yeah. I think you can kind of feel when you're like in the right place. You don't have to go out of what who you are to mm. blend in. You know? Feel comfortable. Also, I feel like because we meet up so regularly, we we'll to try to do that big press. Yeah, I don't right. think I don't know what it is with the gym thing. I don't know what's just that's something different. So. Yeah, yeah. I think it's because you get like the. The, the gym bros. Now at this point they start talking about how they go to the gym as a group to kind of help their physical health and their mental health but on their own accord they began explaining to me and the camera why they aren't the stereotypical hypermasculine gym bro and due to the fact I was conducting an unstructured interview I just let them lead and ask questions appropriate to their responses. Though this topic isn't directly related to my research topic, I found it interesting that they felt the obligation to prove their innocence anyway. They needed me and whoever else watching to know that they didn't associate with the toxic masculine stereotypes surrounding gym bros. Classic yeah. gym bros who are like, yeah. They so, because it can be quite easily, like, strength or size, like yeah. appearance of strength and easily yeah. equate to appearance of power. Okay. Yeah. And then yeah. do it for health reasons and or yeah. mental health reasons as well. And that's the yeah. difference between yeah. you and who are gym bros? Uh, you just referenced. Uh, gym bros just a stereotype, like a term. Yeah, it's just no. a way to call. I was like, like you. If I didn't go to the gym, I just call him my bro. It's not. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, because right. it's like gym, and he's like, I don't know, maybe spotting you or something. Yeah. So are like, you guys? Gym bro like, isn't inherently bad. No, but there can be bad connotations from yeah. it. It's just like a bad person. Like it's not the gym bro is a gym bro is not a bad person, but a bad person is a bad bro person. Yeah. If, yeah. if that makes sense. How has like, gym bro got bad connotations then? I feel like because it's like when people, like, when like it, it you, well, you like, don't usually say for example you said in the definition um, domination over other men or women. That's like usually physical, and yeah. I would assume 
and that's like you wouldn't really get like a really small weak person being able to like beat someone up yeah. if that makes sense one of the factors of toxic masculinity is the idea that the most masculine man will have domination over surrounding men and women. And though I agree with this interviewee's point about physical domination, I've learnt through my other interviews that domination of opinion, verbal domination and domination of social situations are equally if not more essential to the lads for their intimidation factor. So I went ahead and I explained this concept to the boys to see how they would take it, but to also introduce them to this concept. Because as much as people try to separate themselves and avoid toxic masculinity, I think it can intertwine itself into normalities in the way that people, especially boys, think. I think it's also very much psycholo- very much psychological, though. I'd actually argue that... I would argue that domination is domination of opinion as well. And that's what some of my other in- interviews have said. Those who get bullied by lads, they've said that it's domination of opinion. From here, one of my interviewees agreed with my point and began to tell me how it applies to situations between lads and other boys and how that affects their confidence. That you, if you, you think that if you say this thing or you have this opinion, you're going to get judged for it. And that's where lack of confidence takes you keeps you at that position I got where you, you had yeah. that you might say that thing or that opinion and then people completely agree and mm. you just didn't think that yeah. because of how it has been how do you think you get in that process of just gaining confidence how do you break that sort of well, well, I, just, I, don't, so you know, you I don't think I'm out of it yeah, I don't think you're ever out yeah. Yeah. I, I think, think it's, it's always like, there it's just you, bad you, how you fight it yeah. 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 But I'm, obviously I'm small before I kind of cared for no reason at all. I kind of just cared just because people were like, "Oh, okay, it's, you know, it's, it's just annoying because you know it's small and people just think it's weak. Maybe disadvantages in our own sport or just in general, whatever." And uh, now, obviously, I don't care. But it's still there. Mm. It's not because it's just completely gone. It's just because I've learned to just not give a fuck. Fair I'm play. Sure, I'm just I'm with the people that can respect. But I don't give a fuck. So. Fair right. play. How about the rest of you? I'd say for me, pursuing the things which really made me me. Like, uh, mm-hmm. so not just so doing other th- shit which people enjoy, uh, hold on. not doing pe- shit which just everyone does, like doing shit which is like, I really want to do, and it's like kind of, what, right. what makes me me, yeah, 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 it's like what is to me to a core, so it's like, I do this thing, it's not like, I don't do it because no one else does it, but it's like, it's not what everyone else is doing. Yeah. So you just do what you want to do. Yeah. yeah, but that not in a selfish way, if that makes sense. Would it not? Would you not consider that selfish to a degree? Well, like, um, well, no, no, because if you're doing things which like make you you, it's not mm. selfish if you're conforming to the shit you hate to do. Just you don't need to do shit you hate to do. Exactly, just to, or just to fit into a group. Yeah, just to f- I agree with that, yeah. Mm. How about you? Um... I don't know. I'm. St- I still don't really know what I love doing. Mm-hmm. I That's know. fair play. I still mate. like. You know, how everyone's got a hobby. You've got guitar. And you've got. Like, you you have to yeah, but that just means I sit down inside. I hate. I, I, I don't hate sitting down inside. But but that's the game. That's the game. Just based on stereotype. People think that whoever sits inside on the computer is just an athlete. No, it's, no, it's because I like going outside and like really? being in nature. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah. But then it's like when I'm just sitting there and you just sit, you're just doing nothing. It's like I get bored of doing nothing. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So I want to figure out something which I can do outside because I know like outside, but like something I can do which is just fun. Yeah. yeah. But I'd, I'd agree with you where it's like you got to find something which you like. Yeah. And do that to make yourself. A more confident because you didn't, you know you're good at something mm. and like it just makes you feel more whole as a person. I guess. Yeah. This interview provided an insight into the male perception of toxic masculinity, the impact it has on their self esteem and how they cope with it. A huge part of lad culture is misogyny, and considering the harm that toxic masculinity and lad culture has on boys, I wanted to explore the effect it had on women. I sent out a survey to 40 women, reaching out to friends, teammates, colleagues and family members for responses. I got 31, and despite the range of people that I had asked, there was an overwhelming continuity in a particular explanation. On the questionnaire, I asked two questions. One of them said, why do you think boys join lad subcultures? And a huge majority said it was because lads were insecure. Coincidentally, a lot of the explanations that these people provided aligned with a lot of the theories that I'd researched throughout this project. 
The explanations on screen at the moment align with several sociological views that I'd explored. The middle view says to feel like they fit in but to also share their misogynistic and homophobic views and to join in with a group that shares similar views so these views are not challenged but agreed with by others. This aligns with Zimbardo's theory of de-individuation. So... I can derive from my primary research, as well as what I've learnt from existing theories, that lad subcultures are a prominent, harmful, yet also functional group in society. As to why they form, I would argue that there are three reasons. The first reason being insecurity. The expectations of men set by other men through toxic masculinity causes boys who are insecure to join groups like lad subcultures who discriminate others in order to protect themselves. Secondly, Boys may join lad subcultures to feel a sense of belonging in what appears to be an assertive group. Being one of many can be a reassuring cover for those who want involvement while avoiding accountability in such activities. Finally, boys may join lad subcultures because of an adopted or observed behaviour. Boys and men who are brought up with lad cultural norms and values may continue to display this, which explains why in so much of my primary research, people commented particularly on younger boys displaying laddish behaviour. So that concludes it, that's my sociological documentary on laddish subcultures and I haven't filmed a very suiting outro to this because I kind of came to my evaluation, conclusion, done. So I just wanted to roll the credits and say thank you to everyone who participated and to the exam board, I hope you liked it, I pray. Thank you to my advisor for miraculously sticking with my idea. Um, I've learned a lot about the practicalities of sociology and um, videography and I hope that it does well but if not I've had a really good time and I've it's been a valuable experience thank you for everyone who watched whether you're sociologically interested or not um, and thank you for everyone who participated in my primary research